Hello guys, David Vos here. Oh boy, it's a beautiful day. I just witnessed um, a eclipse or the, the fire sun thing and I recorded it and I'll load that up to YouTube as well, guys. It wasn't as spectacular as I thought because where I'm at, I just got a glimpse of it. Just a, it was just a partial um, eclipse. But man, have I got some things to tell you today. Oh, oh, oh buddy, we're going to get into it now. And any of you, who thinks that you're going to click off at this point. Oh, I wish you wouldn't. Friends, this is not going to be boring. I guarantee it. I give you my word. This is going to be the most enlightening video that we've done since. Do you know that the Greeks are the children of Israel? And they are the true holders of the true priesthood. And this is why Alexander the Great was son of Hercules, who is Samson, who is of the tribe of Judah and Dan. And they don't ever tell you that. They, th they always tell you he's of Dan only. But no, he's of Judah. And he brought some Levites and they started uh, an idolatrous religion. Yes, they did. And they took it with them. But it was restored later on. And this is why... We've been talking about the lineage all the way to Rome and then to the Pontifus Maximus and the Rex Acrorum being the Melchizedek priesthood and going on to Jesus. And we got all this information. But it's so incredible to think about unless we know the whole story. And that's what we're going to give you. Like, uh, who's that guy who used to come on the radio all the time and says, and now hear the rest of the story. <laughs> this is the rest of the story. The story that they won't tell you, you will never hear this from anybody because, first of all, it would take a little doing to get this all fished out to where we could even know this story. And if anybody had known this story by now, it's been forgotten for thousands of years, they would probably be some uppity guy at Yale and they work for the devil and they don't want you to know this. So... If you want to know this, you're going to have to wade through this. It's going to be maybe in over an hour here. And I don't think you're going to get bored. But you're going to find out the most amazing things your little mind has ever heard. And I do believe it'll put a smile on your face. And not a joker smile. But a smile of total appreciation and absolute joy will come over you. And if you, at that point, some of you out there still think I'm telling fibs. If you think I'm telling fibs after this, I don't know what to say. Because we're going to be putting it all together. And this is just a tip, as I said. The tip of this iceberg is going to get, you know, less tippier as we go. We're getting a lot of information coming down on this little tip. It's going to be a great big pyramid. And we're going to have the whole thing at some point. Because there's so much to say. But we got to start somewhere. So let's begin. And so it says here, why is Troy not called Ilium in the Iliad? In the original Greek, the city, in fact, is always referred to as Ilium. No more direct transliteration, Ilion. Notice the word lion in Ilion. The people who live in Ilium are the Troys, the Trojans. The territory of the Troys is called Troia, in English normally written Troy. What I wanted to show you is that if you look at Ilion or Ilias, Ilium, it's very close to the Ilia of the Sumerians, which today in Hebrew or in the Arabic script is El or All. Il, Ilil, or Enlil. This Il is the original word. Il or Ilya or Al or El. And so when we see a lion, we, we've always been told that a lion is the king of the animals. Well, the animals are the astrological signs. And so the king is in the summer sky in August, the lion. And Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And therefore, the lion is not just some indiscriminate word, but it's the El. It's the father. It's the king. 
The lion is the king, and it's the L. And Jesus is the L of the tribe of Judah. Isn't that interesting? Now, here is something that is very, very, very interesting we're going to go into. And we're going to get into this in such a way that it'll blow your mind. Uh, you've never heard this before. But this is going to clear up a lot, friends. I mean a lot. What we're going to find out is that everything in history is based not upon really the Sumerian. Uh, it's based upon the Bible. But you get so many different pieces and parts of it and all the other different traditions. And it seems like today we have two traditions that we hold the most dear. The biblical story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Adam, and Eve, and all of that. And you'll notice that Jacob had 12 sons. Well, that's the same as the 12 Olympians, and that is the same story. The other story is the Greeks. And the Greeks, even Americans, know a little bit about Greek mythology. We study it in school. Uh, Shakespeare and, you know, um, the colleges of the great ones who went to school to learn. We always learned about Greek mythology. So, why are these two important? Why don't we study African history much? Why don't we study Chinese history much? Why, for instance, does our capital buildings appear to be Vatican-style, Athenian? And why do they also put Egyptian obelisks in front of these Athenian architectures? We said the other day that the... And this is very important to understand all of this. We said that the Cyclops were part of our history. They represent the dumb, ignorant, less evolved being from thousands of hundreds of thousands of years ago in, in the age of Atlantis. And some people have said, well, why? How could you believe that there are beings under the earth, Dave, when the Bible clearly says that all human beings were destroyed on the surface of the earth. Okay, we just answered the question. Everything was on the surface of the earth. Everything was killed. But what about in the pits of the earth? He said, well, it doesn't say that in the Bible. Yes, it actually does all over the place, but we're just blind. We don't see it. It says that Zeus threw them into the pit, Tartarus, underground. So the Bible actually tells you, if you take everything literally and you say, well, there's a worldwide flood because the Bible says so then you must understand that there is individuals under the ground in great civilizations beneath. A whole civilization of Hades. And you must believe also that there is a higher civilization in the air. Now that one could be some kind of ethereal, spiritual. But I don't know how to conceive of beings under the ground in pits other than dumb, which is the way they depict them, as one-eyed, dumb, brute, orgs or ogres if you want to call them so all of history you'll find people saying well all of history came well we've said that it's all from heliopolis and it is but that's only from one beginning before the flood in atlantis it was here in america the atlantic ocean is the way or direction beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which the Bible is translated that way, but it actually meant the ocean of Ethiopia, which is the Atlantic, is where the children of the Lord or the great Zion was, beautiful for situation in the original. But now we're talking about after the flood, and everything has been changed. The earth and the mountains were pushed up and the, you know, the waters came down and everything on the surface of the earth was changed. From that point, people began to congregate and we find the story that they were all there at Babylon. And it says everybody was there and they all spoke one language. So there were no nations and they didn't have, you know, old black people were in Africa and white people were in the north. That's ridiculous. Some people believe that people who have black skin got their black skin because they were dwelling in a hot area like Africa where it's hot. And the sun made, over time, they evolved more melanin. How could that be? Since there is the North Pole and the South Pole. Both of them have snow. And there are high mountains in Africa and there's snow and there's places, jungle. There is, there is desert and there is snowy mountains with, with snow caps. 
And people in the north don't all live in snow. I mean, there is beautiful tropical areas in the northern hemisphere too. So it, it didn't happen that way. Um, certainly, if you look at history, people have been migrated, exiled, moved out, brought in, and rearranged. The Judeans were brought down to Heliopolis and lived there. They were taken to Babylon, Assyria, Medo-Persia, were taken to China. They were taken all around the world. And Israel is from four different women and they're all different colors. None of this makes any sense. Where is the center? Well, every nation has a story about their Jerusalem, about their Heliopolis or their center. And the center is civilization. And, and it all, ultimately goes back to the center of the galaxy, as we said. And we, you know, for centuries we evolved. This is our history. It's coded for thousands of years. And we see these creatures that are dumb because that was us thousands of years ago. And that's why Germans communicate with Alderbarn, the eye of the bull, you know, the bull's eye. As Alderbarn is the bull's eye. And it's interesting that Orion is trying to shoot the bull's eye. Why would he be trying to do that? To kill the bull? Why not kill him in the heart? Why not shoot him in the heart? Isn't it interesting that the Pleiades, the seven sisters, are riding on the shoulders of the bull, riding the beast? But the bull's eye, you see, would be the direction. If you could take out the eye of the bull, I mean, we have this today, like, oh, we've got to get the bull's eye. Well, we don't think of it. We just think it's the center. That's all it means. The eye, the center, the middle. But it's not about the center, because the eye is not in the center. It's about sight. If you can take out the eye of that bull, it doesn't know where it's going anymore. And it can't make the journey. So, you see, the bull's eye isn't a good thing. And, you know, G.O.D. or Godin had a patch on his eye. And you notice that the Cyclops have one eye. And in the story that we read the other day, Odysseus took a spear and blinded the Cyclops. I'm not completely certain if they had originally two eyes and Odysseus put out one and now they only got one eye. I'm not sure because it says in the story that the Cyclops was blind. So if he only had one eye and he poked that eye out as well, then he was really blind. Now maybe they're really in the dark. I don't know all the little details. This is symbology. It's parabolism. But I want to read you something because what we have to understand is that there is a story in the Bible called the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob, and so forth. That's the whole book. And it's the whole book when you're reading the Egyptian mythology too because they're the same people. It's the whole book when you're looking at Greek mythology because they're the same people. However, it might be strange to find out that the Greek mythology tells us the story much better and in more detail. All we ever hear is Zeus and Perseus and a couple things. You know, we don't hear much. We don't know much about it. But all the details are there. And people don't realize that philosophy is not just some speculation, but it is the search of wisdom and science and truth. And people don't know that the poets like Ovid were prophets. They were priests and poetry was what priests wrote. But today we call it, oh, it's poetry. Just like we call recluses, crazy men on the mountains. But that's not what they were. They were people under a vow in the ancient Osirian Christ religion. They were recluses because they took vows of poverty. And so all these words we're not familiar with. We don't understand what the word politics means. It's poli. That's the city. And we don't know what the word, the root word means. We don't know any, all, everything, the root of everything goes back to the Greeks. And at least the story, as it's picked up from around 1000, 2000 BC, you know, is in detail of how it came down and why we have Athenian cities and why we have the pyramid on the dollar bill. It's all explained in the Greek mythology and nobody ever reads it and if you read anything i'm telling you because i understand this history and i look at 
these individuals trying to write about it. And I find that they are literally completely in the dark. And everything they do say about it is usually absolutely opposite of what's true. Let me show you here. What we're going to find is there is a place called Arcadia. You've probably heard of the Peloponnesian War. You've probably heard of the Trojan War. You've probably heard of, of Troy. And, we, you know, we've talked a little bit about all this. We've talked about Aeneas and Romulus and the beginning of Rome and Greece and Ireland and the Red Hands. And this is all connected. You've heard of the Tuatha de Danon. Who are these Danons? You know, before we get into it, just to wet your whistle here, you've heard in the Bible that when Saul, when Jehovah left Saul, he began to want to go after the deity of David. David was up in the fighting the Philistines, up by Phoenicia and the Hittites, and, and they had the Ark of the Covenant. See, that's very symbolic. The Ark of the Covenant means this, the source. And they had it for a while, but they didn't belong to them. Who are they? And what do they represent? King David, the lion. Now, why? Because he was of the royal blood. And he was, it, it, it's representative of the spiritual man, the inner spiritual being that's supposed to reign. And the outer carnal flesh that wants to have control of the sanctuary but it just messes everything up and everybody dies. This is a big story. So Saul went up to Syria to the witch of Endor. Now it's written that way in our Bibles and very misleading. It never says witch in the Old Testament. It uses the word woman and it never says Endor. It says door. I don't know where they get the word in. I think it's just some kind of syntax. But the, the city was door and the Dorians were from door. And that's very obvious and can be proved beyond any shadow of a doubt. And why is that important? Because when you read in history who the Dorians are, they don't know. There's some kind of a Greek. There were four divisions of the Greeks, the Ionians, the Dorians, and a couple others. But the most prominent were the Dorians and the, Iron, and the Ionians. We've only heard much, mostly about the Ionians. And we don't understand that the Dorians weren't the original Greeks. They were of Dan who came in, the stories in the Bible, we're told that Samson went up and had a relationship with Delilah. We never understood why. If he's a, a Nazarite priest, he's so holy, why is he you know, poking around up there with some woman, right? Well, that was, Delilah wasn't just some woman. She was not just some prostitute. She was a high priest up in Tyre in Sidon. Tells you in the Bible that Dan conquered Sidon and Tyre. And he named it after himself. That's why he, he renames Tyre Sidon. And he, and, and he named the river Jordan after himself. And it says everywhere he went, he named cities and towns after himself. Well, everybody will also tell you that Dan was, or I should say Samson, was of the tribe of Dan. And that's not even really true. Yes, Samson's father was of the tribe of Dan. But his mother was of the tribe of Judah. And every rabbi and scholar will tell you that. So Samson was of royal blood. And he said, yeah, but just from his mother. Well, that's the only thing that really counts in the Bible. Because if you understand that the seed of the woman is what's going to save the world. The seed of the woman, not the seed of the man. And Jesus was born of a woman. And so, if you understand all of this and you understand all of this history, you're going to find out that we've got to trace Samson's line because Samson is Hercules. He's a very important figure. He's a strong man that does everything that Samson does. He's the same person. And Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, and all the great ones traced their line back to Hercules. In other words, they go back to Samson. So we need to know who Samson is. And Samson, by the way, lived at Zora, according to our Bible. But that is really Zara. Now, all of this may sound just incidental, but it's not. The Dorians had a priesthood, and this woman at Dor, or Endor, was a, they translated all different ways. Medium, she was a, had a familiar spirit. I don't know where they get any of this. It doesn't say anything about familiar, or spirit, or, or, or medium, or anything else in the scriptures, they're lying, bald-faced lies. Why in the world would you take a word? In the Hebrew, is ab, or ob. 
That sounds odd to me right there. She was a woman with an ob. In the Hebrew, that's what it says. Go find a woman with an ob. And they, they spell it O-W-B, ob. Pretty weird, huh? I mean, you know, like a lot of the things, like how the true priesthood lived, the little the priest that uh, anointed David as king and Melchizedek king, they were from the city of Nob. These weird words. Or Job from the city of Uz, right? Like the city of Oz. These are weird words. They sort of sound weird because we've had these movies like The Wizard of Oz and all these weird, you know, or the orb or the ob. Or, you know, you're going to get power from an ob? What's that mean? That's kind of weird. Well, the word ob isn't really ob at all. It's the word ab. And ab is the original root of father. I mean, it's, it is father. I mean, abi is my father. It's ab. Ab is father. And if you look at the verse there, this woman was had the ancient father. She had the spirit of the ancient fathers or her ancestors or something. We don't know exactly how to translate it. Some would say maybe she was seeking out her ancestors because then she raised up Samuel from the dead. And that all happened. It was real. Samuel came up and made a prophecy and all came true. But the truth is, we don't know exactly what that means. She was a woman with an ab. Did she have the father with her? Because remember, the Judeans didn't have the father. They had Yahweh. He was not El, but he was one of the Els in the council of the Elohim. So up there in Dor, which was on the west coast of Palestine, today it's up by Hathia or whatever in Israel, this was the place where Samson went. And from there, it says he got on ships and he went to a place called Crete. And I'm going to show you a scripture in the Bible where Paul talks about the Cretans. And Paul quotes from a Cretan prophet. He calls him a prophet. Why are the Cretans got prophets? I mean, why would Paul acknowledge they had prophets? And why would Paul say that that prophet was true and quote what he said? Because we talk about how the Bible quotes from the book of Enoch, and therefore the book of Enoch's got to be true. Well, Paul quotes more than once from the Cretan prophets, and we'll find that Crete is where these Dorians were, and this is where Samson established a kingdom with Delilah, and this is the royal bloodline of Hercules, and this is also the same place we talked about the other day, Sicily, right off the nearby there. Remember, Poseidon got the sea or Japheth got the Isles of the Sea. So this is where Dan went to mesh with them and become the, the Polsai Dan. And remember, Dan then also mixed with Judah and, Pols and Japheth. And this became a royal blood up there in the Isles of the Sea. So Crete and Sicily were two of their main places and there's a little place called Arcadia that if you do any digging you'll find that was the holy place and this is where the city of Peloponnesia was this is why they call it Peloponnesia and they had the Peloponnesian wars and there's a lot we're going to talk about but this is the beginning of everything starting around 2000 BC where we develop the idea of El and society and truth and philosophy and the right to reign because this is the true rightful heir Yes, there was an heir in Jerusalem of the line of Perez. But you see, Dan was of the line of Zerah. And this is why he was born in that town near the border of Judah. So um, Crete then, we'll get to that here in a minute, where Paul quotes it, that they had some sort of lie. And the lie was, I'll just tell you real quickly and then we'll move on here. The Cretes had said that Zeus was born there and that his grave was there. And all of the ancient ones used to say that's not true. It was a lie. Okay, but Zeus is from the area, but in the past and didn't die there. However, Zeus had a child named Hercules. Well, guess what? Uh, Jacob had 12 sons and he had a son named Dan, who eventually became Samson. This is the same story. And he went to that area. And then there's another verse 
of this prophet or one of the prophets of Crete that Paul also mentions when he's at the amphitheater. And remember, this is the same religion of Ephesus and Corinth, these ancient Macedonian Greeks. And this is where all the apostles say, we'll go into the Jew first and then to the Greek. Why? Most people have always thought it meant, oh, and then to the Gentiles. But that's not what it says. It says to the Greek. The Jew first, then to the Greek. Why the Greek? Because the Greek is the other lineal descendant of the world. We'll, we'll, we'll see, you'll see what I mean here in a minute. So it says, if you read any book about Greek history written before 1970, there's one event that will probably be discussed at length that any book about Greek history written after the 2000s will probably tell you never happened at all. The event I'm talking about is, of course, the so-called Dorian invasion. See, so sc scholars don't know anything about the Dorian invasion. They just know what happened. The Dorian invasion is the invasion of Samson. He went up there, remember, in our Bible, and he defeated the Philistines, and this is up by Phoenicia. And these were the original area people that lived up in that area, the original Ionians. So the story goes that in around the 12th century BCE, a warrior people from the north known as the Dorians invaded mainland Greece and conquered large areas of it, replacing the peoples who had been there before and eventually becoming the ancestors of many Greeks, including the Spartans. We've heard stories vaguely in our lifetime as Americans about Spartans, like their warriors or their, you know, a lot of football teams or Spartans or whatever like this. The Spartans were the ones that the Greek, like Plato and Aristotle, revered. Their teachings, their belief, and all of the Greek mythology came from these Dorians who became the Spartans. Sometime around 1600 BC or thereabouts, the Mycenaean civilization rose in mainland Greece. Remember we talked about how the Cyclops were called the wall builders. They're the dumb ones, right? And they built the Mycenaean civilization. Well, that can't be Samson. He wasn't dumb. He's like David who killed Goliath. He's the one, uh, that that would be more the, the uh, Odysseus who was of the Greeks who had to fight in battle with these dumb wall builders, these giants. The same story we have in the Bible. So the Mycenaean civilization was these huge buildings and cities. They started building civilization. They had laws and so forth but when they started building they must have had some intelligence or else they wouldn't have been able to build these things they were being controlled by satan and as we said these cyclops go back to mount etna which is the vulcan mountain which is tubal cain and it goes back to the line of cain so what we have here is a story about this fight between the cain knights and the and israel but it's not all cut and dry. There were certain elements of the Canaanites that were wiped out, these brute, giant, ignorant beasts, but they used them to build the structure. Now, what is? why would you do that? Because the brute carnal mind understand, with the one eye understands technology and physical things and brute force and they're strong and they're giants and they can build things. But there were the wise who came in, the Dorian invasion, and they set up the spiritual aspects and philosophy. And they had to get rid of the angry beasts and, 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 and conquer the, the flesh and become pure. So the people, so, so the Mycenaean civilization was primarily built on the backs of these ogres. The people of this civilization spoke an archaic form of the Greek language and wrote using a writing system known as Linear B. They built large cities with fortified citadels. Some of the most important Mycenaean citadels, or cities, were Mycenaean, Pylos, Tyrenes, Thebes, Athens, Orchomenos, and Gai. Athens! Now remember, Athens seems to be the, the center of Greek thought, right? And this is where they had this big, huge Athenian temple. And this is where we get the Attic Greek that came after the, the Dorian. The Attic Greek. And then after that was the Koine Greek we have in our Bibles. But in the Attic, in the Attic Greek of Athenia, the name of deity was Theos. And this is the same as Dia. 
in other languages. And this is what we have in the Hebrew, which is David. They were talking about David. And by the way, they had a, they had a lawgiver called Minoas. Minoas or Minos is their Moses. It's the same person. Read the story. They're telling the same story that's in the Bible with their own words or, or as it's, you know, pronounced. These, these names are pronounced differently or, a, you know, come down to them differently in a different language. And like I say, from their point of view, from the Greek story, if we read that, you know, all we have is the Perez. All we have is the Jerusalem story, the carnal laws of Moses. But these spiritual philosophers, the philosophia, which is the love of wisdom, this is the love. This is the democracy. This is the other side that we're never taught. We're told about, like you're supposed to believe in it. And oh, ha, ha, Moses, bygone days. Jesus came and did away with the law, right? These are the two different systems. The Pope is from Julius Caesar and from this lineage goes back to Athens. And, and our dollar bill, you know, in God we trust, has got a pyramid. The eye of Osiris. And who is Isa Osiris? Same as Zara, but in different languages. But to follow this history and to get a really good understanding of it, we need to know the Greek mythology. So sometime around 1200 BC or thereabouts, the Mycenaean civilization collapsed. Most of the major Mycenaean citadels, including the great citadel of Mycenae itself, was burned. At least one clay tablet with writing on it in Linear B that was recovered from the burned archive of the ruins of Pylos mentions the people of the city preparing their defenses. Unfortunately, the tablet does not say who these defenses were meant to protect against. So, if we think that they don't know anything about what they're talking about, why are we reading it? Because you've got to start somewhere. And I want to show you from their point of view, because you'll trust these historians more than you would just trust my rambling. So I'm going to go at it from reading it from their stories. Now, I know this is just Quora, but they're kind of putting together and, and sort of paraphrasing these stories that you we would have to read the book of Ovid and we'd have to read Plato and all of these other individuals to get all this story. So we've got to read it somewhere. And linear B writing was totally forgotten in Greece. And for roughly 400 years, we have absolutely no written records. So we don't know what was going on during this time. It was a big war. Because the Greeks, original Greeks, these ogres that were being run by, you know, Poseidon and Japheth and different things, his, and, and, and this high priesthood was now going to be welded in with the Samson line, Dan and Judah. And remember in the story, uh, Dan goes up where he was lauded land and st creates a religion like a Judaism religion. He brings up some Levite priests and they set up a golden calf, just like the original story. And they have this idolatrous worship. So for a period of time, there was some idolatry going on and the Lord in his providence was sending up Samson. Remember, Samson was a descendant of Dan and Judah, but a descendant. So Dan was way before. So Dan's the one who started this false religion. It was Dan. Dan's a bad guy. He don't get a recognition in Revelation of the 12 tribes. He doesn't get an inheritance. Dan's the one who started false worship. It's just Dan. There's no Judah in there. But one of Dan's descendants had a child named Samson. And he married the woman's seed from Judah. And this is the restoration. The, the woman Delilah was the priesthood back to Dan, the Poseidon. But now Samson goes up there and marries her and defeats the Philistines and restores it. Samson restores it. We're going to talk about that point where it's restored and it goes down to Troy and Rome and the British throne. That is the good lineage down to the coming of Christ, who was of the line of Zerah, as we said, son of Caesar. Isa, son of Isis, son of Caesar, son of the Pharaohs, son of the Phoenicians, 
son of all of these nations to be the heir of all the world, of all nations, tribes, and tongues. And so Samson sort of tricked the Philistines and married their wife. Why? If you don't like the Philistines, why are you marrying their wife? Oh, because she was so beautiful. Oh, we saw that song and dance the other day. Julius Caesar didn't marry Cleopatra because she was so beautiful. He had to in order to reign. And so in order to get the Judean line of the proper lineal descendant into this great high priesthood and root out the evil ones that had that had fallen this is how the lord did it in his providence he sent samson up there to to conquer them he sent david up there to to retrieve the ark of the covenant this is the same you know line of thinking here the same theme so in the 8th century bc the greeks adopted the phoenician alphabet adapting it to their own language to create the Greek alphabet. It is after this point that we start to get written records again. Well, they got written records because they had wisdom. And Samson and this particular line by the Lord's providence went up there and began to start learning. And they took the Phoenician, phonetic, and they made a language. And this was not to deceive mankind, but to enlighten us. This was originally the high priesthood up in Phoenicia and it had been corrupted and now Samson was going to go up there and marry their daughter just like Elisha or Elijah who raised up the widow's son and Jesus who raised up the widow Nain's son. This was going to be the restoration of the true priesthood of Melchizedek. Same as David after he conquered the Philistines and got the Ark of the Covenant. He, then he was anointed as Melchizedek. And Melchizedek goes back to line of the Canaanite kings. So then it says, by the time of our earliest written records, there were several different dialects of the Greek language spoken throughout Greece. In the southern and western Peloponnesus, the region of Greece where many of the most important Mycenaean cities had been located, people spoke the Doric dialect. Why? Because Samson had gone in there and Delilah and brought the Dorian or the Jewish Israelite people there. The tribe of Tawatha Didanin, as we'll see. And these, this tribe of the Tawatha Didanin went all the way to Ireland. They, they founded Troy, Rome, Germany, Sweden, and even Japan. And all across Asia, they conquered and colonized the world. And believe me, they came to America and colonized it here too. And it wasn't just Dan, it, you know, it wasn't Dan, it was Samson, the king, who was of Judah, Dan, and the Melchizedek line from the Canaanite priestess. The region of Greece where many of these important Mycenaean cities had been located. People spoke the Doric dialect, which is closely related to the dialect of Greek that were spoken in northwest Greece. Meanwhile, people in the region of Achaia in the northern Peloponnesus spoke the Achaean dialect, which was similar to Doric dialect. People throughout most of the Aegean islands and along most of the west coast of Asia Minor, south of Smyrna, spoke the Ionic dialect, which was markedly different from the Doric dialect in many ways. It's important to follow this, guys. We find that there's four different divisions of the Greeks. People in the region of Attic around Athens spoke the Attic dialect. Now that's the dialect where we get in our Bibles today, Theos, or the, the chief deity, the father of the deities, which is closely related to the Ionic dialect. Somewhat bizarrely, the dialect that is most closely related to Mycenaean Greek is Arcado Cypriot. Arcado is from the Arcadian, which is where Peloponnesia was. And it was spoken in the region of Arcadia in central Peloponnesus, which was mountainous, landlocked, and sparsely populated, but also on the island of Cyprus. Oh, we still have that island, right? There's Sicily, Cyprus, Crete. All these islands is where the islands of the sea were, if you ever wanted to know. Which is located over a thousand kilometers away in the eastern Mediterranean off the southern coast of Asia Minor. Now, there's a map, and you see Pergamum and Ephesus. Now, remember in the Bible, it says that Satan's seat is in Pergamum? Hmm, because this area had both 
Samson going up there to conquer it, to restore it, and Elijah going up to raise up, raise up the widow's son. But there was also the influence or the infiltration of Satan who set up his seat and throne there, which is done now in Rome. Early poetic sources about the myth of the return of the Heraclidia, that's Hercules. The ancient Greeks regarded native speakers of the Doric dialect, the Ionic dialect, the Achaean dialect, and the Arcado crypto dialect, and so forth as distinct ethno-linguistic groups. I'm going to kind of go speed read through this because we don't want to read it all. But one of the main stories that the ancient Greeks told that pertains to the Dorians was the myth of the return of the Hercleidae. Okay, so Dorians have something to do with Hercules. Why? Because as we said, it has to do with Samson. You cannot deny this connection. The descendants of Hercules or the descendants of Samson. You see what I'm saying, friends? And nobody seems to understand this in the scholarly world. The oldest surviving source that mentions this myth is the ancient Spartan lyric poet Tyre Tales who lived in around the middle of the 7th century BCE. As I discussed in this article I wrote in January 2021, Tyrataos is one of the very few ancient Spartan authors who have any surviving works. Tyrataos, fragment 2, has survived to the present day through papyrus Oxyrhinocus, a papyrus fragment discovered in Egypt dating the last, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it says, Let us obey the kings who are nearer the line of the deities, for fair crown Hera's husband, Cronos' son himself, Zeus, gave the sons of Hercules this state. Under their lead, we left windswept Irenaeus and came to Pelops, broad sea-circled land. We have all this history, but we ignore it. We don't want to seem to understand it. If we don't understand this, we're not going to understand why we got a pyramid on our dollar bill or 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 who the Masons are, or who the rulers of this world are, or what we're doing here. We've got to figure this out. The basic outline of the myth that Tyre Taos is referencing here can be gleaned from the latter sources. The myth holds that Hercules was the rightful heir to the throne of the kingdom of the Tyrenes. Now, hmm, how could Hercules have the throne be the heir? Because his father was Zeus. Remember the Cretan said that Zeus died on the island of Crete, but then it said it's not true? We got to fish this out of the water and see how big this fish is and see if we got to throw him back. He, Hercules, ruled the region of the Argoiled in the Peloponnesus. The goddess Hera, however, ensured that the throne passed to Hercules' cousin Eurythusius instead. See, these deities that we like as Christians like, oh, stupid deities, pagans. This is the story in the Bible. None of these deities were anything other than our ancestors. And Hercules was Samson, friends. After Hercules died, Eurythesius forced his descendants, who are known as the Herculide, to flee from the Peloponnesus. The Herculide found refuge in the village of Tyrorthos in Attic. That's why we get the Attic Greek of Theos, which is our modern Zeus. When Yuri Theus tried to attack Tyre Corthos, excuse my difficulty in pronouncing these words, the Hercleidae and the Athenians defeated his army of Yuri Theus, himself died in the battle. And the Hercleidae thereafter tried to return to the Peloponnesus to reclaim their rightful territories and the possessions. But followed the death of the Erie Theos, Atreus had claimed the title of king of Mycenae. He confronted the Hercleidae with his armies and the Isthmus of Corinth. Well, just a side note here while, while I'm remembering it. The word Canada, north of the United States. Originally, that was individuals coming over here on boats, trying to rebuild Arcadia. Right? The center of the world. The great Peloponnesian paradise. The New Jerusalem. And so they called it Arcadia, and today we call it Canada. And some of them, when there was this British people came over and fought with the French, the, uh, the New Franken, the New Scotia, and they had this war. And so some of these Arcadians fled to Louisiana, and we call them Cajuns. 
That's where that comes from. So the people of Louisiana are some of them descendants of the original Arcadians. To prevent outright war, the Herculidae agreed to hold a single combat between their leader, Hileos and Echomos, the king of Tegea. Echimios killed Hylios, and as a result, the remaining Herculidae promised that they would not return to the Peloponnesus for either 50 or 100 years, depending on the version of the story. The Herculidae settled for their intervening time in the region of Histeotis in Thessaly in northern Greece. Tritale's poem seems to more specifically say that they settled in a place called Erinios. When the time of the Herculidae's exile came to end, the, the third generation descendants of the ones who had taken part in the failed invasion led by Hylos returned to the Peloponnesus and conquered it, dividing up the lands of the Peloponnesus among themselves. It says down here that the Dorians were simply the Heracleidae. They originally came from the Peloponnesus, were exiled, and later returned. Okay, this then proves beyond a doubt, according to our histories and the mythologies, that the Dorians, whoever they were, were the children of Samson. Now, I want to go to 1 Samuel chapter 28, and I'll just start reading from verse 1. This is important because we've established that Dor is the people of Samson or Hercules. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. Now Samuel was dead. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those who had familiar spirits. Well, the familiar spirit there, that, that's completely made up phrase. I don't know where they get it. Um, some translations said they had mediums, but that's, again, not what it says. It says they had the Ab, or the father, which sometimes they say it might mean a, a bottle, Maybe they are thinking that inside the bottle they could do some necromancy. I mean, people have made up this whole concept about necromancy and and wineskin bottles and stuff like this. And how much of that makes any sense to anybody, I don't know. All I know is the word ab is the word father. And so these people had the father. And the wizards out of the land. Well, again, the word wizard's not there. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together. Remember the Shunammite woman? And they pitched at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, or Yahweh. Yahweh did not answer him, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophet. See, they were the diviners. They were trying to conjure up Yahweh from Urim and Thummim, which is how the prophets used this breastplate, astrological, these 12 stones, and somehow they, they used lots like dice, and somehow they were able to conjure up Yahweh, but Yahweh wouldn't talk to him. So then Saul unto his servant said, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Okay, if you read it that way, especially if you've been going to a Baptist Sunday school, you're going to think, oh boy, he just stepped in it now. This is evil, right? Well, let me show you what this says in the interlinear, and we'll get it word for word. All right, it was a little bit slow, but there it is. And said Saul to his servants, find me a woman, not a witch, just a woman who is a medium. Well, look at the word there, 178, ob. That I may go to her and inquire of her and said his servants to him. In fact, there is a woman, not a witch, who is a medium at Endor. Now look at the 
five eight seven four. It's just door. There's no N. It's just door. So what is this ob, this medium thing? One seven eight. All right, noun masculine ob ob obi. And this is a bottle made from an animal skin and necromancer. Now that's what they say it means. I don't doubt that there were people that used bottles for necromancy. But I don't know if it's that cut and dry. And I don't know that she was really doing anything wrong because I don't have any condemnation anywhere in my scriptures saying don't use bottles to speak to the Lord. I mean, I don't know what that means, but I guarantee that in the New Testament we get visions and Paul talks about we look through a dark crystal, but then we will be face to face. And he talked about hearing spirits and interpreting them and speaking in the tongue of angels. So this is very, very vague. However, it's Yahweh that said, I do not want you to be a diviner or doing any of this stuff because I hate you. And Yahweh's the one that says, I don't want you to go after other deities. I'm a jealous deity and I'll kill you on the spot if you even talk to one of them. And don't talk to their prophets. But you see, his prophets also used necromancy and brought up Yahweh and heard his voice. So let's dig a little deeper. From an unused word, all right, it says from the same as Ab. From the same as Ab. Apparently, though, the idea of prattling a father's name. Ab is father. Apparently, it's because of you, you, you prattle the name of, a, uh, of your father. Huh? Friends, if you understand what that is saying right there, you get a brownie button. I don't know what it's saying. First of all, if it has to do with a bottle, then why is it that you're prattling your father's name? And what does that have to do with a father? And why are you prattling his name? And what does that have to do with a bottle? They're lying. Properly a mumble. Oh, really? A mumble? How do they know that? Where do they get? They just say it, but they don't explain why they know it. A water skin from its hollow sound. Oh, there they they tell you what they mean because a water bottle has a hollow sound. So I guess they, they got a little stick and they beat on the little water bottle. Boom, 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 boom. And then somehow they could figure out what the Lord was saying. Well, that's pretty strange because Yahweh just used dice. <laughs> well, it says a necromancer, a ventriloquist, as from a jar, a bottle, a familiar spirit. So where do you get familiar spirit from any of that? They just throw it in there. Well, it's from the word ab, ob. It's the same word. You can, remember, there are no vowels in Hebrew. It's ab, ob. It's the same exact word. But where it's used in some places, they call it ob. And where it's used in other places, they call it ab. And they're lying. So let's look at the word ab. It just means father. So what we have here, friends, is a woman from door. It says, in fact, there is a woman who is a father at door. So she was either the father or she was the head or the spokesman or the ruler or she was listening. She had the spirit of the father. I don't know. And I don't know if she got the spirit of the father through a, a, a jar or not, a wine bottle. But that's what it is. And I, I'm just telling you, there's no way that we can read that and say, oh, okay, therefore she's an evil person. Therefore she's bad. Well, here's one clue that no one's ever told you. She's from Dor, the Dorians. And that's Samson who married Delilah and went up and became, guess what? The Eleusinian Mysteries. Well, the Eleusinian Mysteries, they called them that because Elisha went up there and threw out Baal worship and restored true worship. Elijah got rid of Baal and at Mount Carmel up in Syria and Tyre and Sidon and that area and Sepharath, they established the religion of El or the father. And they made a temple called Dionysius, which is the same as Elisha because Dio is deity, El is deity and Isa is Jesus. 
and Eli, Isa is the same word. We've talked about this. And I know you say, where does the N come from? Dionysius. Because the dio with an N on it is syntax. Dion or dius or dia. It's just the Lord and then the Isa. So, going back to the story. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment and went in and two men with him. Now remember, Saul's the one worshiping Yahweh. Well, he's a, he's a liar. He's disguising himself. And guess what? Saul's the one that dies and David wins. And where did David get his priesthood? From Nob, from Bethel, where Elijah had the prophets. And they all went to Mount Carmel up in Syria and established and restored the widow's son. So Bethel was where they worshipped El, the house Beth of El. But Saul was down there in uh, Shiloh. It wasn't until David came along and built a house for, for the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. But Saul was trying to worship this Yahweh. And Yahweh wouldn't even talk to him. Yahweh was jealous. Yahweh was angry because Yahweh knew that David was winning. And so Saul went and disguised himself, went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me a familiar spirit. Let's take a look at that in the Greek. All right, 1 Samuel 28, verse 8. So disguised himself Saul and put on clothes other and went he and two men with him. And they came to the woman, Isha, by night. And he said, conduct a seance, please, for me, medium. Oh, now it's a ba'ob. Okay. And bring up for me the one I shall name. Now think about this. If Saul was this king who followed Yahweh and Yahweh blessed him up to this point until finally Yahweh wouldn't talk to him no more. He got mad at him. But he had blessed him. And if Yahweh's the true deity and Saul had been following Yahweh, do you think if he believed and had spoken to Yahweh and knew that Yahweh was the true deity and Yahweh wasn't going to talk to him no more, that Saul in his right mind would go and talk to a witch if he knew that witches were demons? What would be the point of that? Why would he say, oh, I need a medium if mediums don't exist? He say, yeah, mediums exist, eh, but they only talk to devils. Well, this one talked to Samuel, you know? And Samuel said, why are you bringing me up? You know, hey, I'm, I'm sleeping down here. Wherever he was in paradise, you know, he's busy playing pool, right? Uh, eating apples in the paradise garden. And he got disturbed and had to come back to this mess. And he goes, hey, yeah. And by the way, Saul, you're done and you're going to die. And this is how you're going to die. And it all happened exactly the way Samuel said. So what is this word? So medium there is ba'ab. And that just means something father. But let's take a look at this conduct a seance. 70, 80, quasome. Okay. It's quasam, kasam. And the answer, according to them, is to practice divination. It's a denominative verb from quasem, to practice divination. First off, didn't Joseph went down in Egypt wasn't he a diviner? Remember when he brought his brethren down and his father Jacob and he said, okay, go back to your land and he put his divining cup in one of their saddles. Oh, he had a cup and he was a diviner. Maybe that was a, a bottle, not a cup. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows what they did with this cup. But I do know that sometimes you took a cup and you put wine or water or something in there and you stared into the cup, that's how you would get a vision. But I don't know what you do with this cup. I think of maybe genie's lantern. Maybe you'd open the cork and pop, out come a genie. I don't know. But the story goes that when Joseph accused them of stealing his golden cup for diminution he put it in their saddle and they're about to leave and they're like hey somebody stole my diminution cup 
And they called him back. I'm missing my divining cup. And didn't Moses learn all the way to the Egyptians and have a staff in which he divined and he threw it down and it turned into a serpent? Didn't Daniel interpret the dreams like all the wise magicians? Didn't he become the head of the Magi? So I don't know about whether or not, even if this word is divine, even if we don't even know what the word means, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. But let's see what it really does mean. In a good sense, Proverbs 16.10, the king's lips as an oracle. Oh, they use it in a good sense, huh? Let me see that one. I want to see that one. On divination is the lips of the king in judgment, not must transgress his mouth. So whatever the word really means, it's used in a good sense. And the kings do it. And you're supposed to obey and not transgress his mouth. But it says that this divination, divine sentence, witchcraft. Oh, divine sentence is the same as witchcraft, guys. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, it says it's from Ka Cam, a lot. Hmm, an oracle. Remember how Yahweh used the priests who had the Urim and Thummim and they rolled dice to get answers from Yahweh? I guess it just depends on who you divine, isn't it? Well, let's take a look at that word. It's to practice divination, Quasam. So what is this word, Quasam or Quacam or whatever? What does it really mean? What is it? I mean, forget what they say it means. Let's go down here. Strong's exhaustive concordance. Diviner, prudent, soothsayer, use divination. All right. It's a primitive root properly. You're going to be honest about it. What does it mean? It means to distribute, determine by lot or magical scroll. By implication to divine. Oh, by implication it means to divine. But actually it just means to you distribute by lot. Now, what does it mean to use lots? Well, the apostles used lots, didn't they? To determine which person would replace Judas Iscariot. They threw lots. Remember, the Roman soldiers threw lots to divide his garments. What does it mean to throw lots? Remember, they got the promised land by lot. They divided up the land by lot, meaning they rolled dice to see who would get the land. Well, they determined that if you rolled the dice, you weren't playing favoritisms, and only destiny and fate would give you the land that belonged to you. So if you roll dice, you're saying, okay, I'm going to trust in whatever fate has for me. Now, I don't know. I think it was more than that because they had 12 stones and it had to do with astrology. However, the point is it has to do with throwing lots, which is exactly what Yahweh himself was doing. He just didn't want you to consult anybody else's deity. Now, that brings us back to door. So, now we see that completely lying to us when it says that they went to find a woman with a familiar spirit. It has nothing to do with that. They went to a woman and she may have used lots or something. She did something very similar to what the priests of Yahweh were doing. And as we're going to show, she was actually the priest of El. That's right. So Saul swear to her by Yahweh, saying, as Yahweh liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up? And he said, bring up Samuel. Well, see, if he didn't believe believe in this he thought it was devils and stuff like that if that's what he believed he was a worshiper of Yahweh and he thought this is all evil then why would he say okay bring up Samuel knowing it's going to be a devil this doesn't make sense my friends and when the woman saw Samuel she cried with a loud voice and the woman spake to Saul saying why hast thou deceived me for thou art Saul and the king said unto her be not afraid for what sawest thou the woman said unto Saul I saw deities ascending out of the earth. Oh, so Samuel's a deity. Did anybody ever teach you that in Sunday school? There were some deities coming up out of the earth, according to this high priestess. She called Samuel a deity. 
And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground, and he bowed himself. Why is he bowing and prostrating before Samuel? Because Samuel's a deity, friends. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and deity is departed from me. Well, his deity, my deity. If you read that, it's just his deity. Not, not all the deities. Well, maybe all of them. Okay. Because he'd followed the wrong deity, you know. And what are they, all the other deities are going to now forgive him for that? Well, maybe they will. But they're not going to let him continue to be king. Because he's just a trickster. He's deceiving himself. He even deceived the woman who brings Samuel up from the spirit. And he says, My deity is departed from me. And he doth not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou makest known unto me what I shall do. Saul knew that the woman who had the ab, he knew that she could do it. So what have we learned, boys and girls? We've learned that the translators are full of C-R-A-P. And they are doing this for a reason. They don't want you to know the truth. Would you rather follow David or Saul? Well, I would rather follow David and Samuel. And by the way, Samuel didn't mind coming up from the spirit in spirit form for this woman with the ab in the city of Dor because that's where Samson went of the line of Judah and Dan who married Delilah, which in the Bible, it says very clearly, not only was Samson uh, a strong man, meaning that he had power from the Lord, but he was a Nazarite priest, as was Jesus, friends. So now, you ever ask yourself, what does it really mean to be a Nazarite priest? Remember, Samson wouldn't cut his hair because Jesus wouldn't either. Jesus was the Nazarene. And so, What about these people that are up there in Crete? You know, Dor was the place where Samson was originally. He met Delilah, and then he went, and it says that the Herculadai went to Crete, and they established the Arcadia and the Peloponnesus and all of this. And they were the people of Samson, or the Dardanians. We'll talk about that here in a minute. They're called the Tawatha Dedanans, which is the tribe of Dan. Tawatha means tribe, if you go back to the Druidic tongue, which is where this word comes from, up in Ireland and, and England and stuff, the Druids had the word Toth, which meant tribe. So, let's take a look at these people up there in Crete. It says in Titus, the Apostle Paul says, Paul, a bondservant of deity and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of deity's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life with deity. Who cannot lie? Promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of deity, our Savior. Oh, you Jehovah's Witnesses, don't you read the Bible? Don't you got a Bible? It says right there that Jesus is deity, our Savior. Right there. To Titus, a true son in our common faith. And he says, for this reason, I left you in Crete. Who? Titus. This is the book of Titus, okay? Remember how Paul says elsewhere that even Titus did not get circumcised? Well, why is he being compelled to be circumcised? He's in Crete. Isn't that supposed to be a bunch of Greeks? Hmm. He says that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city. Oh, we're just talking about some Christians up there in Crete. Well, wait a minute. Every city in the days of Paul, every city, we're all Judeans? You'll see that here in a second. The circumcision. Uh, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, the point elders, or point out the older ones in every city, as I commanded you, 
if a man is blameless, a husband of one wife, having faithful children, blah, 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 blah. And then, oh, and it says, teaching sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Okay, a lot of insubordinate individuals. What do you want us to do, Paul, about these insubordinate people like Garrett? Uh, well, he says, I want you to, well, here's what he says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not. Joshua, if you're listening to this, I love you, brother. I tell you, I counsel you, do not teach things that you do not know what you're teaching. Because if you do, your mouth must be stopped. And if somebody doesn't do it for you, the Lord will. And if you're teaching lies, Derek and Joshua, because you don't know what you're talking about, you're some self-proclaimed prophet, then you're subverting whole households and you're teaching things which you ought not. Why? Why are you doing it? Are you doing it for the sake of dishonest gain? You say, oh, I don't make any money. I don't, I'm not talking about money. I bet you'd take the money if it was given to you. But is there any other gain that you might be getting out of it? I don't know. I'm just asking. One of them, a prophet of their own said Cretans are always liars evil beasts lazy gluttons now wait a minute one of them one of who the Cretans that's what he's talking about he says wait a minute he's talking about Cretans right one of them Cretans one of their prophets well it actually doesn't say their prophets just one of the prophets talking about who idle talkers deceivers and those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped. One of them, a prophet, said, Cretans are always liars and evil beasts and lazy buttons. Why are the Cretans circumcised individuals? Why are there a bunch of circumcision up there? Where, where does Paul get this? Why is it in quotes? Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Cretans. Because he's quoting the prophet of the Cretans. I'm not going to show you here. We ain't got no more time. We're over an hour, way, way, way over. But this is an actual quote that they all quoted. It had nothing to do with the Bible. It's just a one of the Cretan prophets. And this is what he said. And, and Paul says the guy's true. He's right. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith, not giving heed to what? Jewish fables. These Cretans, this prophet of the Cretans was a Jew. And Paul says he was a, a true prophet. And he said that, that Cretans were liars. They were liars because they were claiming Zeus was buried there. It's not true. They're liars. So, they're Jews, but their deity is Zeus. And they got true prophets. So, what's going on here? Understand, the prophet wasn't lying. The prophet was saying that some other guy who was a Cretan had been claiming that Zeus was buried there. And so, he says, well, Cretans are always lying. And a lot of the stuff that they were teaching were just the commandments of men. Who, who, who turned from the truth. So they weren't speaking the truth. They were speaking fables or lies. They're always gluttons. As even one of their prophets said. Jewish fables. The circumcision. Liars. It says they profess to know deity, but in works they deny him. Uh, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Wow. So, my question is, aside from all the other little questions that just arose there, why is Paul saying that Cretans have prophets that have testimony that is true? 
Why is Paul quoting from the Cretan prophets? Remember, Paul's from Tarsus, not far from Corinth and from Sicilia and Crete, not far from there. Remember, Barnabas owned, it says in the Bible, a lot of land in Cyprus. So we've got Cyprus, Crete, and Sicily. And this is the Macedonian area. Why is Barnabas owning all this land and he sold it all and gave all this wealth to the apostles? Because as we've said, Barnabas was a very high lineage, powerful man. I'm not going to say too much about who he was here. We've talked about it before. But Barnabas is also called Joseph. And he is the one that went with Paul. And when they got and they preached at Corinth and Ephesus, they called Paul Mercury, but Barnabas they called Zeus. Why were they calling him Zeus? And that's who they themselves worshipped? All of them in that area worshipped Zeus. These are Greeks. And they said that Barnabas was the chief deity, Zeus, because he owned the entire island of Cyprus. And as we've said, Cleopatra was given that land by Mark Anthony. That was her kingdom. That's as much as I'll say about that. But Jewish fables because the Cretans are always liars and therefore they're speaking fables. And so Cretans are the circumcised, the Jews. Could there be Jews in the island of Crete? Well, yeah, Barnabas owned the land. And as we have said, the entire area, these Greeks, were Dorians, which is the lineage of Samson and Delilah, Judeans who brought Levites with him, and Danites, and were called the tribe or the Tuatha de Danon, and migrated to Rome, Italy, and then up to Ireland, and then to Britain. And Genghis Khan was also of the same group of individuals. They colonized the entire world. Now, I've got to tell you one last thing before we go. I know we're way, way, way over. I hope you don't uh, aren't upset with me, but we really got to get this in. There was a man named Epimenides. It says here, he wrote a treatise on Minos. Now, Minos, Minos, Mini, Mini, Monos, I don't know. But this is their Moses. Now, the first king of Crete, who was supposedly a son of the deity Zeus and a human wife named Europa, in his treatise, Epimenides has Minos addressing Zeus in a poem. They fashioned a tomb for you, holy and high one, Cretans always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies, but you are not dead, you live and abide forever. For in you we live and move and have our being. Now, that's the whole quote. So we've already seen where Paul quotes Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and idle bellies. And he said that prophet was true. But the last part, for in you we live and move and have our being. You might remember that one from the book of Acts. Paul at Athens. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, by that time, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. So, now he's about to tell you that they weren't always idolaters. He says, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange deities, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof you speaketh is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, and we would know therefore what these things mean. For the Athenians and strangers which were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. 
Paul before the Areopagus. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, this is Mars Hill in Athens, I perceive that in all things ye too are superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown deity. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. Deity that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in the temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. For though he be not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of deity, friends, if we're the offspring of e deity, then is not deity our forefathers? There you go. That's exactly what Paul is teaching that we are the offspring of deity. And we ought not to think that the deity is like into gold or silver or into stone or graven by art or man's device and that the times of this ignorance deity winked at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, here again, he quotes from this prophet. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So here, Paul is quoting again one of their poets, which he called a prophet earlier. So twice now, Paul is quoting from their works and calling the prophets and saying that they're true. And he also says that this is the deity that we worship, this unknown deity, because they, they came across a statue and they said, this is the deity that we worship, this unknown deity that you guys don't realize is the Lord Jesus Christ. But now, friends, we're going to have to end it there. But I ask you the question, who really are these Cretans? And did I not show you from the scriptures themselves that according to the Apostle Paul, they are the Judeans, they do have true prophets, and that Paul himself agreed that these are the children of the Lord. That's why he was going to the Greeks. That's why Peter addresses them. That's why John addresses them, you know, in the first chapter of Revelation, he says to the seven churches, and he says Ephesus and Corinth and all these cities up there. Peter says to the Disipora in Antioch, and he names all those cities. And Paul directly goes there and preaching, and he says, we got to go to the Greeks, to the Dispora. These are the ones that are still Israel, but they've gone into all the world. And if we can show that these are truly children of Israel that went to Greece, and as we've seen, proved that it is a royal bloodline, then that means that everywhere in the world that you see people, these are the children of Israel. Because the children of Israel were, went captive into Assyria, and from there they went all over Asia, to Japan, we've talked about that in other places. They've gone into Europe. They went to Greece, to Rome, to Ireland, and to every country on the face of the earth. But we have so many other things to tell you. I'm going to have to leave it there. I hope you guys have a really wonderful evening. And may the Lord bless you. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. And we're going to have some really great stuff coming. Have a good one.